Looking for a new true crime podcast to binge but don't have a lot of time? Check out my podcast, Bite Sized Crime. My name is Joy. I'm a school librarian, obsessive researcher, and lifelong true crime nerd. Each week, I bring you a new case to dissect. I focus on the facts, giving exposure to some of the lesser known stories in the true crime world. And each episode is less than 20 minutes, just right for your busy schedule. Get your true crime fix and subscribe to Bite Sized Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. Hello, everybody. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. see our dance moves that we do but during the pretend music <laughs> when we pretend that our intro song is playing and it's not even a real you know dance vibe but we make it happen how dare you everything's a dance vibe if you I guess try hard i don't enough. think they're playing it at you know any clubs but i could be wrong at the club could be a remix out there <laughs> well now brad has to make that on i know i was just beat. thinking well shoot now brad's gonna add a beat to it <laughs> I look forward to it. (laughs) How's it going? What's new? Oh, just living the dream. I'm home alone this weekend, so I'm just rolling around and, you know. To all of the stalkers and criminals out there, this is recorded in advance, so by the time you hear this, she will not be alone. So cool it. Yeah. (laughs) But wait a minute. I also have two big dogs, and they're scary, and one's really protective, and she'll bite you. Okay. And you turn New Zealand at the end there and maybe don't like just tell all of your personal information. <laughs> Have you learned nothing from me? Um, my social security number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly like looking in my rear view just to make sure I'm not being followed. You are one of a kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are still training the dogs, obviously. That's a yeah. lifelong thing. And we took them to a park for the first time yesterday. It was Total chaos. A dog park or just a normal park? Just a park, but a lot of people walk their dogs. Oh, yeah. And we took them there on purpose because there's all these side trails that lead to picnic tables that look out over the woods or the water, and you can sit there. So I knew we could get yeah. get there and they could kind of observe. It was total chaos. Banksy was – didn't he freezes when he's scared, so he was frozen the whole car ride. Oh, my God. Wouldn't move. Brad had to carry him. <laughs> and then Harlow was the opposite, just super excited mm-hmm. and all over the place. And then they finally calmed down a little bit once they got used to it. So we started trying yeah. to take them onto the main path and just walk them back and forth a little bit. Okay. And Banksy did pretty good, actually. Harlow was so excited the first time he saw a human, he tried to jump up and say hi to her. He was the same height as her. I mean, I pulled him back before he got anywhere near her, but I'm like, that must be so terrifying. Yeah. I was like, I'm sorry. Especially if you're scared of dogs. Yeah. She was luckily very cool. He was nowhere near her, but that's his first instinct is to run toward her. And then he feels the tug on my leash, which bucks him up like a Bronco. Yep. And then he like is in suspended in the air for a minute. And he's just a maniac, but we just got to keep, Keep, he just gets He's a so maniac, excited. maniac yeah. in the park. <laughs> like that remix? Singing's becoming a new thing for you on the podcast. I know, and it really shouldn't be. <laughs> That's your thing. I disagree. I think you have a, a very melodic voice. Oh, I don't think so. Listen to that high note you just hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they had the best time. I mean, and they napped all afternoon. They were passed out. Oh, they, yeah. Don't you love it when they go on a new excited. adventure? Like, even if we bring them to go get ice cream or something, they're like, oh, my God, that was just a whole adventure. I need to get a nap for three hours. Yeah. I try to take I try to take Harlow to school with us now for drop-off, too. Oh, good. Just to get him That's used to so the car. That's so cute. Yeah. He's, so he's getting more excited, and he's getting better at it. Yes, I actually, I do always say goodbye to my son, and then I also say goodbye for Harlow. Harlo? Which I think the drop-off people enjoy. Yeah. I mean, goodbye, think about it. That must day. be like... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's his voice, if you're wondering. 
Like that's got to be a perk of the, the stress of that like drop off line. You get to see a cute dog. Oh, yeah, that and that drop off line is stressful. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> Nobody's moving at the right speed. I'm sure. It's it's one of the most stressful tasks <laughs> ever. All right. Well, what do you have for a tea today? Well, as you know, I was on a trip this week and I don't know why I'm talking like this. <laughs> and tempo. it was wonderful. <laughs> Nothing is wrong um, with your headphones. And a coworker, a coworker gave me some tea, which was really kind of him. He is also a tea snob because whenever I travel, so <laughs> whenever I travel, I have a little, have I talked, said this story? It looks like a little diaper bag. It's like a, what? it's like a small pouch. I could take a picture of it. Put it on Some would say a sachet. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. And it folds and then you fold it out and there's like six slots where you can put tea bags and then it folds back in you pin it. And I take it with me wherever I travel because I mean, who wants Lipton when they get there? Oh, no offense to Lipton. I, no, I, yeah, I, I do the same. I always bring okay. my own tea. Yeah, like because Americans don't care about tea generally on a commercial level, so it's not like they're they might have nice coffee, but they're not gonna have nice tea. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, they always have a coffee maker and like flavored coffees in the room, but they rarely have tea. And if they do, right, right, it's super basic. Right. So that's me. And so um, we've talked about tea a lot. He also makes his own chais at home like he does everything right so we're on the same level there um so he got me i think the the company name is called brook bond and it's taj mahal loose leaf black tea rich and flavorful the taj mahal experience begins the moment you taste your freshly prepared cup it's the rich flavor that comes from specially selected tea leaves and with that first sip you will be saying wattage I don't know what that means, but I don't. Probably you can't be something. saying that right. Wa Taj, Wa, space Taj, exclamation point. It probably means something in another language, don't you think? I, I don't. I don't. I really am confused. What does it I mean? I thought it was going to be something like you'll be saying. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. it means like wow. All right, looking up here. What? Starting to do a lot of on the fly research as well. I know you're, you're really developing your podcast personality. It's usually ex- expressed with great enthusiasm and joy, like a cheer. It's like wow. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So they they know, and we don't because that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just it looks like it's just a really good black tea. All right. Well, enough looking. Of Let's taste it. The highest quality. And so I made this tea as I would prepare. Any other black tea with a little bit <laughs> of milk. So is that water? Whole and milk. Tea? <laughs> the recipe for tea is well, so Well, tricky. I'm not putting sugar in it, and some people do that, <laughs> and but some people put creamer in it like a psycho. Are you going to come out yeah. with your own line of recipe books here for tea? <laughs> hey, every tea is different. Treat it respectfully. Okay, here we go. Okay. Smells like black tea. Yeah, it smell. I could smell the body. Ew, that sounds weird. Um, you you know, like it. Oh, that sounds perfect. It fills the nostrils. <laughs> fills the nostrils. Yep. Mm-hmm. You just created three new Ooh. t-shirts. Oh, it's rich, baby. They didn't lie about that. I think you mean wattage. Is that <gasps> what, it, what it is? <laughs> You're a spit take. A real life spit take. I've never seen it. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> hey, if I choke to death, nobody can save me right now. <laughs> no kid doesn't know CPR. I mean, the Heimlich or whatever. <laughs> I'll walk her through it. She's smart. <laughs> this is really, really lovely. I need another sip because that distracted me. You did spit half of it out. Wattage. Yeah? Did it? it? It's a beautiful body, actually. Oh. So, you know, when you're sunbathing and you're at the perfect, it's not too hot. Maybe you just came out of the ocean. (laughs) 
and you just feel the sun like soaking into you, but not in a cancerous way or like a, you know, um, burn way. It's right before then you're, you're absorbing the heat. You're just laying down. That's what this tea feels like. Okay. Okay. It, that it has that rich meal. Like I'm knocking my mic around. I'm so excited. Wattage mm. indeed. It, yeah, it, it has that rich tea flavor. It's very malty, which I love in a tea. That's why I like Irish teas. Malty? Um, yeah. What does that mean? I, Irish and Scottish teas are a little more malty than uh, English breakfast, for example. It's just a little de- more uh, depth. You know, As mal- in malty. layers? Like multi-layered? Malty. Like a mal- oh, malt. 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 Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Now you're making yeah. sense. I thought you were just saying half words now and expecting <laughs> me to keep up. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a stupendous black tea. A what? So it's getting a stupendous thumbs up. Wattage. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna create an ad for them with my face and a thumbs up. Wattage. <laughs> wow. All right. That's so exciting. So thank you, coworker who doesn't listen to the show, doesn't even know about it. Peace and love. Do you remember the time that you came to visit me and you got sunburned so badly that? Oh, <laughs> it lasted for days, and then you had to to wear long sleeves and hats for the rest of your visit. Even it lasted though it was 90 for degrees. months, actually. That one yeah. burn on my rib cage, and yeah, that was bad. Shoulders, yeah. Did I? It get felt sunburned? so good though. Yeah, but you no, were I underneath didn't. something because I had on eight hats and I was underneath the canopy <laughs> and I had sunblock four thousand on. So and you had one of those. What do they call them? A cover up. That's why I said the canopy. No, no, on your body. Oh, I was also wearing, yeah, I'm fully covered head to toe, <laughs> except for the moment I go into the water. I just was got so excited because down here it's too hot to, to sunbathe, so I was like, we're on a boat, it's beautiful out, and I was just absorbing the rays, but we went past, <laughs> we went, went past, past the level of this you. tea. You did. I'm like, I'm fine. Do you remember, do you remember when that's the same trip that Brad also was fishing off of the boat and he got real cocky and then he <laughs> caught the canopy with his <laughs> It's a great trip. That was oh, ridiculous. That. that was the best because he was getting dangerously <laughs> yeah, I was close like, to I was us. getting nervous because he was yeah, like, I like, flicking it back. I'm like, Brad, you need to be yeah. careful. I know what I'm doing 40 <laughs> times and then which, which just was the best. I got so stuck in that canopy. Yeah, yeah, he knew it too. Okay. Good times. Well, I'm glad you get a good tea today. Yes, me too. I think you're really going to like Ooh. aspects of this case. I mean, you're going to hate uh. it, but it's Obviously, I didn't. We didn't change genres overnight, <laughs> but we are going to 1890s Australia. So I'm hoping you can help me with some pronunciation. G'day, mate. Nailed it. Apologies in advance. <laughs> okay. Shrimp on a barbie. Why is that the only? That's the only thing Brad was saying too when I told him I was researching this case. That's all. <laughs> is, is that even accurate? It's a, it's a classic line. From where? I don't know where it came from, but... Like one that's... Australian man cooked shrimp and now forever all of Australia... Well, they do say, bo- bo- you know, Bobby, the, bo- the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I feel like people in Australia must be so over that. I don't know. They probably are. If you're listening in Australia, let us know how you feel about that. We did have a, a few Australian listeners I saw recently, so apologies. Okay. So, late 1800s in Australia, though, is... M- Maybe not super exciting because there is an economic depression. Crime is pretty heavy. So there are lots of hangings happening. And things like baby farming are going on. Do you know what that is? No. Like they produce babies and then sell them? No, it's more that women give birth to babies and then they would give the babies to a woman or a place. For, as like foster care or to adopt out, and then those babies would just not live. Birth control, folks. Birth control. Mm, was was the eighteen hundreds? So you're being a little judgmental. No, I know. That's I'm just saying an example. That's where it would be very helpful. And the women were doing what they thought was best for their children, and then the the person who had the child was murdering it. That's terrible. Anyway, we're not doing that today because I don't think you can ha- handle it. No, well, what we're talking about. Is a woman named Martha Needle who grew up 
during this time in extreme poverty. She suffered physical and sexual abuse through her lifetime, first as a child and then as a wife. No. And in 1894, she becomes the third of four women hanged at the Melbourne jail in the 1800s. Oh, my God. Spoiler. Well, how'd she get there? It's It's still a twisted story. Also, I hate to admit it, but the old way to spell jail is very different. G-A-O-L. It, it took me a very long time to understand <laughs> what they were talking about. <laughs> Come on. You've seen Outlander. Oh, but you haven't read it. <laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't sit there reading the closed captions. <laughs> it really threw me for a loop. I mean, I figured it out quickly, but I'm just saying. Anyway, so Martha <laughs> was born April 9th, 1863 in Merpco. Am I saying it right? I have never heard of that place. It's a really small town in southern Australia, so okay, I think that's right. And my buddies, the sheep, as we know. Yes. Throwback to Lizzie Borden episode. They're running free. Wildlife is everywhere. And there's a post office in this town that receives mail once a week. It's different. Get it together, Raj. Now, Martha's mother, Mary, gave birth to her while she was on the run. So I need to dive into Mary's story just a tad. Oh, Mary married, it's so confusing, a man named Joseph Charles. And together they had three children. Now, Mary had abandoned the children more than once. And this time she had left them to run away with a man named Daniel Foran, for, or Foran, once Joseph had left her officially. Because he also kept coming and going. Oh. And Mary had come from Scotland and made the trip at the age of 17. And Australia was being sold at the time as just a dream location. Really? Plenty of work, plenty of men. Come on I'm over. I think the first time the British started shipping the Aussies over, because, you know, at first it was the criminal colony. So I wonder right. how many years we are past that. Anyways, look, sounds like it's changed its tune. This is 1852. And the ultimate plan here is to bring over young Irish and Scottish women to fill domestic labor positions and also mm. to find wives the gentlemen that are there. That's what, that's what they're hoping. It's like an e-harmony really to the max, you know? Mm. LinkedIn and e-harmony all oh, together. Sounds terrible. Well, that's what they're trying to get jobs and wives. So at 18, she marries Joseph, and that's immediately they start having kids, and they're working at Anlaby as a town. It's a sheep station. That's where they're working. I'm not going to know any of these unless they're big towns. I don't know Australia very well. Okay. After, they actually have four kids to start, and that's when Joseph takes off. But that youngest child dies of dysentery. It's pretty rough conditions. Uh, Oregon Trail. And she's left with three kids on her own. Now, Mary leaves as well. And she, at the time, is pregnant with Martha. Mary says that Martha is Joseph's child, but she still ran away with Daniel. Oh. Daniel's from Ireland. and he Ireland. he had been in the army, but he kept deserting it, and so which was a big offense. And so he actually had D's tattooed on him. Wow! To show that he was a deserter, and he's also he's also on the run. Sound like tough people. Yeah. Now, while Mary and Daniel are together, Daniel is a shepherd. Oh my God! Martha is brought into the world, and Mary becomes pregnant again, and they have another child. This time, this is Daniel's child, Daniel Jr. Oh boy, she has a question, folks. Brace yourselves. Do you think (laughs) that Mary gave birth in a stable? I mean, maybe. He was a shepherd. (laughs) But this I don't believe this is the start of the same story because (laughs) the couple finally gets married in 1870. That same year, Mary gives birth to twins. Oh, boy. More kids. But one of those twins dies. Mary becomes pregnant again. That's what I'm saying, man. Birth control. I bet they wished there was such a thing. Oh, gosh. Yeah, they wished. But the conditions are so bad that Mary is constantly fighting, bear with me, purulent ophthalmia. There has to be a common name. Which is basically an incredibly bad eye infection that swells your eyes shut due to bacteria. Pink eye times 10. Yeah, it sounds worse. It wasn't conjunctivitis. So she's constantly struggling with that. And she's in and out of the hospital for it, as well as in and out of jail for being drunk and disorderly. So Martha, she's the oldest of this group. 
right? She's technically the youngest of Joseph's children, but she doesn't, oh, she never met Joseph. Yep. So she's the oldest of this crew and she's often left at home to care for them. So when Mary gives birth again to this child where she's been in and out of the hospital, in and out of jail, the baby dies the same day. So Martha is surrounded with poverty, alcoholism, unstable parents. Her siblings are dying. Yeah, it's really really hard. It's not easy. One of the times Mary is at the hospital, a neighbor hears screaming coming from the house and when she walks by she actually witnesses daniel assaulting martha no daniel is actually brought to court hang him and martha is so scared and nervous she's about 12 at the time ew i'm i'm done that she doesn't say anything but her younger brother daniel jr speaks up for her and says what he's seen achilles and Martha just confirms that that is true. So Daniel's actually sentenced to two years of of prison, but he only serves one. I'm done. Daniel had also put Martha's mother, Mary, in the hospital once Mary confronted him with this news. So Mary is back in the hospital because she was beaten so badly. Martha has to appear in court. You know what? This guy needs to fall in a ditch and never get up. Well, in 1875, at the age of 12, Martha doesn't really go back to the house. She starts working. She's a domestic that. servant. Can you imagine being 12? I know 12 is older a lot back then. Older. I know, but still, like you're not, your body just isn't developed. It's, you're not fully grown. You need more rest. You need more nutrition. You're yeah, growing. If she goes home. She's getting no, I know. Said. Oh, poor baby. Well, Daniel kind of gone now forever. Mary keeps leaving the kids, and now Martha's not there to take care of them, so the brothers are sent Mm -hmm. to homes. Yeah. Now, Martha's really best hope here is what? I don't even know. Finding a man. Finding a guy. Like, marriage is really the only option. But find a nice guy. Well, she finds a carpenter named Henry Needle, and he's hardworking, and this is a quote, of good physique. Okay. Uh Oh. Oh. Uh... What's that saying? Jesus was a carpenter. Oh, (laughs) Wattage. Martha becomes pregnant at age 19. And when she does, Henry asks her to marry him. And they get married in North Adelaide on May 15th, 1882. She's 19. He's 22. So at least it's age appropriate. Yeah. That's. I just want him to be nice. I want him. I want him to treat her like cowboy treat treated um, Tony Joe. Which is a throwback to our last episode. Yeah. You should you should adjust your expectations. No. Well, she needs a worry. break. Henry gets what's coming. So on August 4th, Mabel Needle is born. It's a cute name. Isn't it a cute name? Pretty quickly after that, Elsie Needle is born. Now, Mel- at this time, Melbourne became more popular. And so yep. it was harder to find work. So they moved after Elsie was born. Also around this time, Henry's behavior starts to escalate. I'm willing to bet there were signs of it before, but he starts to become very jealous whenever Martha talks to anybody else. Oh, my God. And they're taking in borders, which never goes well. A lot of these stories have just these wayward borders (laughs) that really get you into trouble. They either assist in murder or get murdered. (laughs) Just don't do it, folks. Don't do it. (laughs) If you're on Airbnb, always check private house. Don't ever go for the private room. It doesn't work. You're going to be mixed up in some crazy stuff. Yeah. Anyway, he would get really jealous. And every time she was talking to anybody, which you'd have to talk to the boarders that are in your house. Hello. He would beat her for talking to these men. And when she was pregnant one time, he beat her very badly. And at one point, he beat her in the head with a, a wooden plank. So he's not turning out to be great. He's becoming increasingly jealous. He also goes back to Sydney for a bit to look for work while Martha stays in Melbourne. I would move or smother him with a pillow. She gets a little bit of a break. But while he is away, Mabel falls ill in the winter of 1885. No. And she's only three at the time. And the doctors believe that she had a brain tumor, which there is nothing you can do for that in 1885. 
And she, they are too poor to really afford good medical care, and they're too poor to afford a burial for when she passes away. Oh, so God. the saddest part of this is that Mabel was actually buried in a mass grave with 11 other children who had died from tuberculosis. <sighs> Obviously, Martha is devastated. She's still got Henry in and out. September 14th, 1886, she gives birth again. Can you imagine having to go through all this while you're pregnant? No, I cannot. And she gives birth to another daughter, May. So now she has Elsie and May. In October of 1889, Henry gets sick. Good. He dies from subacute hepatitis. Oh, that's what hopefully the death certificate it's said. super painful. And benefits were common at that stage for husband and wife, but you had to have a will in order for your partner to get the benefits, and Henry didn't have a will. Oh, of course he didn't. Idiot. Martha technically had benefits that were hers to get from his passing, but he didn't have a will in place. And I'm pretty sure she asked him to, like, as he was sick, to kind of get it together, and he didn't. So Martha had to go to court, and she did, but it just took a long time, and then she got these meager benefits that were paid out to her. Okay. Not sure what to do. Martha's, I mean, she didn't get a windfall of money from her husband passing away, right? She still has the two girls, and they're still young. They're still yeah. very young. And she goes back home because that's all she knows, to, and to see her mother. And gets revenge on Daniel. Well, Daniel's long gone. He's out of the picture. He he went bebopping around somewhere else. Nobody knows he's where he's dead Dubai. somewhere. He actually lived a long life, unfortunately. But fuck you, Daniel. Anyway. She goes back and marries a total mess, her mother. She's still being arrested for drinking. At one point, I mean, I kind of can't blame her, honestly. I know, right? You self-medicate in the yeah. darkness. She's, but she's an alcoholic. She's not helpful to Martha sure. in really any way. She is in and out of, of the destitute asylum, meaning mm -hmm. if you have absolutely no money, it's a place where you can go. go but ahead. you have to prove that you have absolutely no money. And so if you have family <laughs> members who have money, you're supposed to oh. lean on them to help you. So at, at certain points in her life, Mary actually sues her different children to pay for her Yikes. expenses. To toxic mom alert. Yeah, it's it's rough. Ugh. So, so Mary's no help. So, But Martha does get lucky. She starts a relationship with a man named Otto Yunkin. I would just never start a relationship again. I would probably join a convent at this point. Or I would become a total cowboy, like, rogue. You have two young kids. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. That's why I say, like, but she can't. But I think you're going to like Otto. Hold on. Otto. <sighs> Otto's... All the men seem to suck so far. But, table's okay, about Otto. to be turned. And Otto's about to be just the nicest person in the Good. story. So Otto, it's almost like a courtship, you know, what you, the stories you hear. He would come and visit with the girls. He'd visit Martha, and he'd bring little presents for the girls. Oh. And he was very, very nice to them. Elsie and May really, really liked him. And Martha and him were good friends, and he was probably the only person in her life that was nice to her. Mm. But that same year that she started visiting with Otto, Elsie becomes ill, and no. They believe that it was a condition due to malnutrition because Martha's struggling so hard financially, it's hard for her to keep food on the table. God. And Otto started visiting more when Elsie was sick, and she ended up dying from no. gangrenous stomatitis, which so happens due to malnutrition and is made worse by the fact that you lose your baby teeth, so it's harder to eat, and it starts to eat away at the yeah. attacks the tissue and bone in your face. Yeah. So Elsie passes away. Now she's buried in the same grave with her father. And then in 1891, May also becomes no. ill. She also has another condition associated with malnutrition. And Otto visits every day that May is sick. May ends up dying from tuberculosis. Come on. Because she's so weak from the malnutrition. This Martha's sucks. devastated. Yeah, I know. Martha's devastated, but she's also still poor. Like, she doesn't have anything for herself. I don't know, man. I might give up at that point. Yeah. Well, 
So Otto says, hey, Jesus. why don't you come live with me and my brother and we'll, you can room with us, board with us, and you can be the housekeeper for me and my brother, Louis. And she agrees. So Martha moves in, but pretty soon after she moves in, she falls into a deep depression. I get that. <laughs> yeah, with intent to self-harm. And in a letter she writes to Otto, she describes that she wants to leave this world. Yeah. Otto is super concerned about her, rightfully so, and he brings the letter to a doctor and says, what do I do? How do I help Martha? Do you know what the doctor says? Something terrible. You should marry her. That'll cheer her up. That's not how that works, actually. That was medical advice. Oh, my God. That was medical advice. I can't imagine the pain that she's in, and then you get that, oh, boy. So... Otto agrees. He's like, okay, he'll do anything for his friend Martha. So he asks Martha to marry him, and he has to first kind of clear it by Lewis because Lewis is the oldest brother and their father is no longer. So Lewis kind of runs the house and runs things. Yeah. And Lewis says, okay, that I agree. I mean, this is not a cure. <laughs> Plus, at this time, Martha's being sued by her mother oh. for money. Being engaged is not Prozac. It's not talk therapy. It's mm. not <laughs> being being engaged does really nothing except maybe make you happy for an hour. Yeah. So she starts having outbursts, swinging back and forth between depression and anger, which yeah. depression and anger are really the same thing, just with a different face. Two sides of the same coin. But Otto is, he's going to stand by his woman. He's like, nope, I'm marrying Martha. And Louis and his mother, or their mother, starts saying, yeah, we might want to reconsider this. We don't think they start opposing the relationship. Uh-oh. But Otto says, no, I'm, I'm going to see it through with her. In 1893, the spring of 1893, Louis himself becomes ill. And he has he's diagnosed with a dental condition, so his teeth keep getting infected, which oh. makes it hard for him to eat. And then also the infection, right, makes him sick. And Martha sits by his side and nurses him and is just super attentive and caring. And that kind of repairs their relationship a little bit. Lewis is thinking maybe he was too judgmental on Martha. She's really mm -hmm. been helpful. She's really been great. But Lewis struggles off and on with this illness for a while, all the way into – like for a full year into May, at one point they actually hire him a professional nurse to come and take care of him because it's clear that, you know, Martha's doing everything she can, but she's yeah. not a medical professional. But in May of 1894, Lewis dies at the age of 30. And the official cause of death is listed as gastritis and endocarditis. And the doctor says, you know, this is kind of an unusual case. I'd really like to do an autopsy. Uh -oh. But Otto declines for religious reasons. So for for Lewis's funeral, Otto is obviously there, and then his other siblings, Herman and his sister Emma and their mother, all come back to you know make arrangements and yeah and take care of Lewis. And Herman actually stays on at the house for a little while longer, and he talks to Martha and he says, you know, I know you and my mother haven't got along in the past, but I really think that she is grateful for how you took care of of my brother, and I think mm. you guys can move past it, but you can't live in this house anymore until you are married to Otto because now that my brother's gone, it won't look right. Oh. And so he tells Martha that she'll have to leave. <sighs> the next day, Herman becomes ill. Oh, I see where this is going. Otto is terrified that he has contracted the same disease as Louis, and he calls the doctor, and the doctor says, listen, this is really weird. Louis shouldn't have died from gastritis. I, I, I don't... Honestly, these symptoms, Cotton. these symptoms are more in line with poisoning. Yep. So they take Herman's vomit and they Ew, send it away wow. for testing, which is a sentence I didn't think I'd say. And at this point, Herman says, hey, I hate to break it to you, Otto, but I only get sick when Martha would bring me a drink. And so he tells the police this. And while the police are waiting for these tests to come back, they also set up a mini sting. They send Herman sting. back into the house. Listen, this is so crazy. They send him back into the house to ask Martha for a cup of tea. So he goes in, he sits down, he asks her to make him some tea. She does. He takes a sip and says, it's awfully bitter. 
And she says, it's just tea. What are you talking about? And then he leaves, excuses himself and goes out to the porch where I guess the policemen are just hanging out. And he says, hey, the tea doesn't taste right. And so they come in, you know, guns blazing. Mm -hmm. They're in there and they take the tea and then they search the house. And in the kitchen, they find rough on rats. Arsenic. Common household product, which is arsenic. And they take the tea away for testing. And they also take Martha, who is flat out saying, I'm innocent. Now, instantly... The press assumes she is guilty, and they run with it. Oh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> so not only are they blaming her for Herman, his oh. attempted poisoning, they're also that blaming Lewis. her for Lewis. They're also blaming her for everybody who's ever died in her family. Perfect. That's fair. And the press is saying things like, Mrs. Martha Needle, who could and did literally smile and smile and murdered while she smiled. <laughs> okay. That's a terrible headline. Work on it. <laughs> you need to work on that. No, that's an actual sentence in the in the article. They were calling her things like, here it is, truly it must be said that in all the catalog of Australia's most detestable criminals, Martha Needle's name must stand out as the most repulsive. Okay. Yikes. So her lawyer is not super pumped about the press that she's getting because that's not helping his case. Also, you might ask, how does Martha have the funds to get a lawyer? Otto. Well, Otto pays for it. Ah. He thinks she's innocent. He pays for a lawyer. He gets actually a famous lawyer named David Gunson, who was famous for defending a man named Ned Kelly, who was this like Australian, I'm technically a murderer, but maybe like a little bit gangster-like. Okay. Is really exciting stuff. Uh, he's famous for defending him. I mean, he was executed, so I don't know if that's a good, <laughs> re- I don't know if that's a good resume builder. But that's who Otto hires, and Otto is arranging for people to come visit Martha in jail. Oh, that's nice. But I don't know who she'd want to see at this point. I, well, not his family. I'll tell you that. But she has yeah. her own friends, and the papers are kind of eating this up. Like I said, everybody's life is tough. Everybody, what Martha yeah. is going through. I mean. The arsenic is a little troubling, but you take that out of it. People are losing children. They're losing (sighs) husbands. They're losing wives. They're hungry. They're poor. They're sick. And this is real exciting stuff. They don't have TV. This is like, whoa. Something for them to escape. Yeah, right. That's the entertainment, which is terrible. They even build a wax figure of Martha and put it on display. What the fuck? She hasn't even been convicted yet. I couldn't. No, I'd leave town. Her lawyer said, you, you got to take this down. Like, like, this is not really fair. Weird. This is not going to be a fair trial. So eventually the initial tests of the tea that she served Herman come back and they, of course, have arsenic in it. Yeah. That she served Herman as well as his vomit. Okay. And they des- decide to exhume the body of Lewis to see if he also had arsenic. And they had found the rough on rats under the sink and Martha was the one who had purchased that. She had actually gone to a pharmacy that was not near the house like and usually she goes to you know pharmacy a but she went to pharmacy b and she brought a Mm. friend with her you have to sign for this stuff during this time Mm. period so everybody knows that she bought it so they exhume lewis he comes back also full of arsenic okay so in the summer of 1894 they also exhume henry elsie and may all were buried in the same grave remember mabel they do not exhume because she's in the mass grave they, it's, they, she didn't kill her kids. Well, on July 1894, Martha's in court for charges against her. And it's the Victorian age, so there is a certain way to dress for mourning. Okay. For two and a half years, you're supposed to dress in mourning for a husband. Bingo. What is it, like a black turtleneck? It's all black, and then at, for the last six months, they call it half mourning, and you can wear grays and purples <laughs> in addition. And that, okay. And, and really only like you can't and you can't wear certain fabrics wow. and it's like head to toe your shoes your everything has to be black what religion and men is only, this no it wasn't it's just the times it's just the etiquette wow. and men have to only have to wear like a black band around their their hat or something really yeah really and you know it was there but there was i read something for an excerpt from a newspaper that said basically like hey Times are really tough. Just kind of dress how you want to. <laughs> Basically, they summed it up. They're like, you can observe mourning if you want, but like we get it. Yeah. And in the, in the 1800s. So she is observing this. And I have to 
think, I mean, it's a huge pain in the butt. Everybody should be able to wear whatever they want. But I bet you there was a little bit of something comforting about everybody instantly knowing that you were upset. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> there's probably yeah. people probably treated you a certain way as soon as they saw what you were wearing. Sure. But still, I mean. It's, but also you if know. your favorite color was black. No, well, yeah. Not going to go well <laughs> for you. <laughs> so she's initially charged with intent to kill Herman, but eventually once she's tried, she's just charged with the murder of Lewis. Young. Oh, okay. Otto is the called to the stand, obviously. He recounts their relationship. He explains, you know, how it progressed. He reads Martha's suicide letter out loud, which brings Oof. her to tears. And Otto also explains that Martha has quite a temper and what he calls seizures, and they come on without a warning. And afterwards, she becomes comatose, and she's unable to focus her eyes or even feel pain. Whoa. What is that? What would that be in current day? It happens for minutes to an hour. Where she's just like flying off the handle? No, where she, like she has a fit and then she's frozen. But is it a seizure fit or is it an anger fit? I'm not sure. Okay. I, I heard both and I think maybe she'd had both because she would also have other fits where she would be awake and she would think that he was Henry and she would like pick her hand up to block her, a hit. And he is, Otto was never violent with her. And she would grab objects in the room as if they were her children and talk to her children and try to get them Stop. out. Stop. This is so sad. The question comes back, well, why? Everybody kind of thinks that she murdered Lewis because he was not He's 100% behind Otto and Martha getting married. But Otto says, well, Martha was the one who kept postponing our wedding because of her physical ailment. She also had some physical issues and she wanted to wait till she was healthier. And so they think, well, why would she even bother to hurt Herman? Herman said it's because he had just gave, you know, he had just said you need to move out of the house. And then the next day he starts feeling sick. Mm -hmm. Now, during while this testimony is going on, the tests come back. Henry had arsenic in him as well as May. No. Elsie wait, is. Wait, 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 wait. But sometimes arsenic's medicine back then. Well, Elsie had arsenic as well but like teeny tiny 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 amounts right that and could so, be medicine so her lawyer actually argued yeah brought up everything we've talked about in previous cases like hey arsenic's everywhere it's on toys it's in wallpaper it's you know in things at this time and it's used as for medications and so Elsie is a little bit of a hmm because maybe but Henry for sure and May had quite a bit as well and they also seem to be prolonged exposure, whereas Lewis just had a bunch. Mm. Uh, Henry and May seem to have it over time. So that's not great. And all the doctors who signed the children's and Henry's original death certificate say that they would, knowing that information, they would change the cause of death. So the pro prosecution starts bringing in witnesses to kind of delve into Martha's married relationship now because she's not on trial for Henry, but if she's done it before, that's going to make it seem like she's done it again. Mm. And they have people on the stand saying that Henry was a good man. And no, that he wasn't. On several occasions, I'm glad he Martha was had said she shouldn't have married him and she'd made that a mistake in marrying him. Yeah, at one she point, did. <laughs> yeah, she did. At one point, this gentleman's on the stand and he's saying how Henry was so solid, so good. And the defense attorney says, well, was Martha ever not a good wife? And the guy said, well, one time she was at my house when she should have been making tea for Henry. And the lawyer, the lawyer I mean, he said it in, you know, 1890s conversational tone, but he basically was like, are you kidding me right now? Nah. She was late making tea one time. Like he goes, he was like, get off the stand. I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> it's like, You're ridiculous right now. They try to establish this motive of Otto being ripped from Martha would be the worst thing that ever happened. And obviously she would like she did she wanted to be free of Henry. Those yeah. are the reasons behind it. And they also brought in one of Martha's oldest friends, one of her childhood friends. And her childhood friend said Henry was abusive. He hit her in the head Good. constantly when she was pregnant. She would have she also testifies to Otto's fits, right? Like she said. Yeah. Martha would have fits just like Otto described where she'd faint or be and be frozen minutes to hours. The verdict takes minutes before they come back with guilty. And when asked if she had anything to say, she just says, I'm not guilty. It is undeserved. I am not guilty. 
And the judge said, listen, I don't want to keep you in suspense. He's kind of repulsed by her. He said, so I'm just going to let you know your sentence is going to be death right, right then and there. Now, the lawyers start to argue that maybe she's not mentally stable, that maybe she wasn't aware. And at this point, Otto has kind of come to the think that she did it, but that she didn't know what she was doing. That's where mm. Otto ends up. Okay. He doesn't think that she did it intentionally. And he thinks that there's something <sighs> wrong with her, that she has some sort of mental condition that stopped her from knowing what she was doing. Yeah. And so there are – the lawyer kind of argues that a little bit, but not – maybe not enough. And there are committees who also step in and try to argue that she's not mentally stable and that she should be – her sentence should be changed to life or she should be put – you know, in a mental health hospital, but no, they're not going for it. The day before her death, Martha gets a visit from a reverend and the reverend really wants her to confess because some of the jurors felt guilty and he wants to make them feel better. So he's really pushing Martha and she's starting to get upset. And then he finally (sighs) says, you know, Otto thinks you did it. He knows you did it, which Otto never said hoping to get her to admit it once she thinks the last person in her life, you know, believes that she did it. And she gets pissed. And she starts yelling at this reverend saying she doesn't believe him and she refuses to talk to him. Good. Now, the next day is the day of her execution. That morning she gets up and she writes a letter to Otto. There are also questions about whether you should execute her just because she is a woman. Like, you shouldn't execute a woman ever is kind of the – Oh, some people are taking that stance. And one of the papers says, if it be bad form to hang a woman, it may be hinted that there is something lacking in the etiquette of a woman who poisons half a dozen of her friends and relatives. (laughs) It's like, fair point. Fair point. Yeah. Yeah, it's fair point. So it's just, you know, it's that double sided or some of the things are hurting her because she's a woman and then other things are unfair. Just like, I mean... True equality, we should yeah. be enlisted for the draft, for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not I'm not doing well in that situation, but yeah, I hear you. Sign me up! Anyway, Martha writes this letter to Otto. It's, it's so sad. This is a quote from that, uh, the letter. My darling, as you wish me to write you, I will do so. But truly, I do not know what to say to you on this my last morning on earth. In a few hours, I should be free from all sorrow. But you, dear Otto, must live on for a time. And she goes on to just say, like, she can't wait to see her children again in heaven. And she'll wait for him and meet him in heaven. Jeez. She signs it with love and sympathy from your loving Martha. Oh. So Martha was executed October 22nd, 1894. She was given one last chance to speak. And she said, no, sir, I have nothing to say. And that was it. And her execution, I know this sounds weird, but it was planned very well. So it was quick, very fast and efficient. But they made death masks during that time. And her death mask is on display at the old Melbourne Jail Museum. Weird. Everybody has a different mask. They take uh, like a plaster of your face after you're dead. What? And they put it on display. Wait, 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 wait. Just for display? Or I thought maybe they would have to wear a mask while they're being hung. That's a little weird. I, it says that the masks were made immediately after the death so that it would capture the features and that they were made for a number of different reasons. That's bizarre. Can you imagine how creepy that is? Yeah. Pass. I'm going to pass on that tradition. I didn't think you'd be like, hey, let's go to Australia and check out that <laughs> death mask situation. Anyway, Otto goes on to get married. He has six children. He starts an incredibly successful construction company that is still in business today. Good for you, Otto. Good good for you, Otto. You're a solid dude. You're a solid dude and a very terrible story of sadness. Yeah, and, you know, I question some of your decisions, to be honest. I wouldn't have yeah. felt – I wouldn't have blamed you if you were like, hey, you're going to have to find your own way out of this one. But some people think it's possible that Martha had factitious disorder, otherwise known as Munchausen's syndrome by proxy, which we've talked about in some of our previous episodes. Gypsy Rose. Yeah. Which seems likely because the children – I honestly think Mabel died naturally. I think she was sick, the first child. Yeah. I think that's the consensus that Mabel really got sick and passed away. I think for sure Henry – Henry died first and she was – 
I think that might have been on purpose because she couldn't take it anymore. And he deserved it. And then Elsie and May, I'm not sure about Elsie 100%, but mm. every time the children got sick, Otto would come around. So what does that mean? Th- like she would get attention. Oh. And so that's why people think if she had this disorder, that's really the main driver of oh, factitious disorder is because of the attention you get while got it. the person you're caring for is ill. And so that's one of the theories floating around today. There are others, too, that maybe she had PTSD and had blackout periods. She for sure had PTSD. Yeah, no doubt. But I I just don't think the method to me works. I don't think it's very – poison is very calculating. And she never accidentally poisoned herself. Mm-hmm. It, it seems very planned out, very calculating. It's also over over long periods of time, especially for her own family. So to me, I, I think she probably knew what she was doing. I don't know if she meant to kill. Yeah. Especially her children. Yeah. But I think she was okay if the gentleman died. And yeah. And I think she knew what she was doing, but that's another argument people bring up. And that's what Otto ultimately believed is that she had no idea. Got it. And it, to, to whatever, you know, mental health issues she did have – Because she clearly had something going on. I mean, you can't – her eyes wouldn't even blink. And Otto said they'd have to drag her up the stairs and she wouldn't even stir. Like, and parts of her body were clunking against the stairs. So she's not – something is going on. People also believe that she had an addiction problem because she used something that was just one of those medicines that was over the counter for everyday use, but it was filled with opiates. Oh, yeah, sure. And – it, you know, it would have been fine for her to have been using it. I mean, socially and like prescribed, people wouldn't have thought that was weird, but she was heavily reliant on it. So she's also having addiction problems paired with whatever else is going on. Hmm. Plus, she's just in a terrible, terrible situation. So whenever you're struggling with addiction and mental illness, hello, there's going to be things that just make it so much worse. Yeah, of course. Domestic abuse, poverty, and between 1859 and 1899, there weren't even double digits for applications for divorce. Like we've talked about this before. Women Mm. had to show at least two things that were pretty hefty and men only had to show one. Yeah. So in Southern Australia at that time, there weren't even 10 applications for divorce. So (laughs) you don't have options available to you and you're not well. No. Right? Now what's interesting about this And also interesting genetic component is in 1920, Martha's nephew, Alexander Lee, was executed at the same age as Martha, 31, for poisoning his wife and three of his children. Whoa. He had recently hurt his hand. He was a shearer and he'd hurt his hand in a shearing accident. So he was in the hospital and he was out of work. And then he fell in love with his nurse, which I believe was one-sided. Oh, boy. And after all of those things happened at once... He returned home and murdered his wife and three of his kids. Oh, my God. And he was her nephew. And that's, you know, the author who I read, I read The Secret Art of Poisoning by Samantha Battams. And she was looking into something and came across the Alexander Lee article and thought, oh, this is interesting. And then there was one little line that said he was the nephew of Martha Needle. And she, no one had really talked about the connection between them. Hmm. And she's now written a book on Martha and on Alexander. Okay. Highly recommend it. She had so much insight in the book, talking about the conditions of Australia yeah. at the time, talking about what Martha would have been going through just as a woman in the 1800s in Australia, but then also factoring in the theories about her mental health and what could have right. happened, and as well as all just the dates and facts. Uh, yeah. I mean, what do you think? I think uh, this is – everything is bad. That's my general feeling around this story. Um, there's, like, no highlights. It's a sad story. But I think she – you know, like, all the things you said, she had PTSD. I mean, she had a terrible fucking life. When you just, yeah. She had no escape. She had no comfort. I think she probably – she just slowly got more ill mentally as she went through all of the bad stuff in her life. And probably, yeah, did did kill those people. For sure, she's killing the men. And I really think the children, whether or not accidentally. I just wish she had expressed it to Otto before. What part? Like, hey, I know your brothers want me, 
me to leave and it's making me want to kill them. <laughs> so that's a tough conversation. And then maybe he would have convinced her out of it. And been like, I'll talk to him. Well, you know, Otto, they did talk to, I mean, she didn't say I want to kill him. Can you help me? But she, they did talk about it and Otto reassured her that he was going to marry her still. But I think it's such a threat. Yeah. To, you, you know, it's kind of like the Tony Joe situation. It's such a threat to any kind of comfort and right. just general needs that are now being met that she right. can't She's finally in it. an okay space. I mean, you know, not great. But still. also if she does have factitious disorder – you know, that's that's her tool for getting close to people is they're sick. So that's her way to fix things is they're sick. Yeah. And then if he happens to not be around, that works for her too. And if she happens to be able to care for him, that works for her too, right? There's, I mean, I certainly have empathy, but I, I think that she knew what she was doing, whether or not she yeah, – I do too. You know, she knew she was poisoning them, yep. kind of like the Bertha Gifford take was mm-hmm. like – she knew she was poisoning them, and then what happened after that really didn't make a huge difference, <laughs> yeah. which is sad. I'm glad Otto carried on. Yeah, he made it through. Dang. It's fucking depressing. Yeah, I know it is. Oh, Martha, Martha, Martha. So do you have any last words for us? I have a, a lot. One. Lay it on me. And I've said oh. it again. Nope. I've said it before. <laughs> Not yet. You haven't. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is the best time to be alive because... She just said it again. <laughs> because for, for most people, if you're in a, a stable uh, country or, or environment, you have access to medicine, you have access to employment. Uh, there are some types of laws that protect you, but like, just imagine, like, living back then, she is assaulted and has to work at 12. Yeah. Again, that kind of stuff does happen still to this day, but it's, we're in a very different world, and we like to complain about it a lot, but this is the best time to be alive, generally. Again, always exceptions. Two, I was wondering when the Australian accent developed, because... I was wondering that, too. Like, I, I need to look up exactly when they were forced to emigrate over. But just because it's a lot of Scottish and Irish. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I wonder when that happened because this was what, 100 years after ish, like 70 to 100 years after the first colony. And just like here, the Southerners have the closest accent to British. I know it sounds weird, but who said who think told about you it. that? That's true. Think about who it. Who told you that? I learned in history class. How do you yeah. figure? Think about <laughs> how? how Southerners talk. I don't feel like I'm talking British right now. I don't feel like I'm talking British right now. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. It's a real thing. I'm serious. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Three. Okay. All right. Continue. <laughs> three. Men or women, if you don't like your partner even talking to someone else, the issue is you. <laughs> yeah. um, and for self-defense classes are great and birth control. <laughs> Do they go hand in hand? Like, here's <laughs> the might. condom and here's how you punch someone in the nose. Have yeah. a good night. That's a good Perfect. idea. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free. Anybody can go ahead and take that because I'm not gonna <laughs> so let's do that work. that open source. Yeah. I'll leave. All right. Whew. And who should listen? Southerners, British people. Yeah. There's a connection there. Um Australians. I have some sweet tea and a cup of tea, please. <laughs> I'm telling you, look it up. Irish, Scottish. You're usually right. <laughs> um, let's see who else. Just, you know, general hard workers, people who have struggled through mental illness and are still with us, and maybe a kangaroo. That, this is not a great, like, mental illness success story. I know, but they could be proud of themselves. Yeah, you should, should be. I agree with you. But, like, I guess you're doing better than – there's more yeah. resources available to you. Let's go on and use them because there was nothing yeah. available to Martha That's, other yeah. than getting engaged. Going back to point okay? one. Yes. Why don't are you sad because you lost all of your children? Why don't you get married? That'll fix everything. <laughs> get a life, doctor. 
Yeah. Dr. Ugh. Dumb Face, am I right? Doc- yeah, Dr. Dummy. Yeah, he's, also the, he's also the doctor who's like, Lewis, you just have a toothache. You're fine. Lewis <laughs> is like poison for a year. Yeah, maybe he needs to have his uh, license examined. Yeah, yeah, he's probably still practicing. <laughs> sure. He's 200 years old. He's a vampire. Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. Now we're going off book here. All right. Well, you can find us on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook at Twitter. No, nope, that's not our handle. <laughs> I know, but you didn't say Twitter. <laughs> because you just started adding it. And I didn't. Knows about that's it. been there the whole time. I just haven't <laughs> talked about it. Never. Anyways, whatever you can tea find time us. Crimes. <laughs> yeah, you can email us at tea time crimes at gmail dot com. Man, you really hitting those falsettos. And you can rate, leave us a review, review. please. Oh right yeah, now yeah. we're at twenty as of this recording, and hashtag we'd love to see them. That's the most desperate tone I've ever heard anyone say. <laughs> leave us a review. You know, you could say hello. Don't just let them say what they want to say. <laughs> I am yeah, support the show a podcast if you, listener. Or maybe not. I don't know. Do, do you, you do you. Thank you so much for listening if you've made it this far into Rate this with chaos. words. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm out. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> You're nuts. Lordy.